Research is on peacekeeping uh, troop contributions, uh, national troop contributions to the United Nations peacekeeping. It's an interesting topic because it kind of melds the two worlds of, of military and peace. Um, and so uh, today I'll be presenting on uh, definitions of peacekeeping. I thought I'd start with a quotation, uh, so you can see that there. Um, this is from uh, the recent uh, crisis in the Ukraine, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, and the, in the eastern Ukraine, uh, the, um, the self-proclaimed uh, Republic of uh, the Donetsk People's Republic, um, the Russian news agency uh, Itartas uh, reported that this council of this self-proclaimed Republic was calling for uh, Russian peacekeepers uh, to intervene on their behalf and protect them from the uh, so perceived authoritarian government in Kiev. Um, so you see a particularly unusual uh, use of the term peacekeeping here, not what most people would think of when they, when they hear of peacekeeping. Um, another example of an unusual term for peacekeeping, this is from uh, former uh, defense minister, well then defense minister of the Liberal Party, John McCollum, uh, at the beginning of the uh, Afghanistan intervention when Canadian forces were being started to be deployed in large numbers. And he says that this Afghanistan is a tough and dangerous mission, but is also in the peacekeeping tradition of Canadians. Now, there's a lot of people uh, who would disagree with that depiction of peacekeeping uh, in, in terms of Afghanistan, and in particular in terms of the operations that NATO does. Uh, another quote, and this is from an uh, academic article about uh, urban crime. It says that disadvantaged communities do not have the internal resources to organize peacekeeping activities such as crime tip hotlines, home security surveys, volunteer patrol organizations, and neighborhood crime launches. Another very different use of the term peacekeeping here in terms of urban crime and uh, kind of, uh, community watches. And then finally, a quote from the uh, 2011 NATO review, which uh, says that peacekeeping is anything is there anything but an activity for whips? Um, you want to see if I can bring it down? So another depiction of peacekeeping is whatever it is, it's not something that whips do. Um, so with these quotes, we see <laughs> with these quotes we see a really wide range of pretty extreme uses of the term peacekeeping domestically, internationally. Uh, in terms of Russian intervention, NATO intervention. And um, so with that in mind, what is the United Nations definition of peacekeeping? And the short answer is, is there is no United Nations definition of peacekeeping. Um, the UN Charter never actually mentions peacekeeping. Uh, it's, not, it's not defined legally. And uh, there's some vague references in Chapter 7 of the UN Charter to international enforcement action saying that the United Nations Security Council has the ability to, has the authority to um, take any action necessary in the face of threats to international peace. But peacekeeping itself as a term evolved uh, in the post-World War II period and uh, has kind of changed its form and um, as a result it's never been really strictly legally defined by the, the United Nations. So this kind of ambiguity of the definition of the term has led to a proliferation of meanings of peacekeeping, not only in you know, real world examples, which I talked about earlier, but most notably in academia, in international relations theory. What is peacekeeping and what is not peacekeeping? There's a huge range of, of perspectives and definitions on that. So um, my research in my paper uh, drew up a bit of a, a spectrum of these definitions of peacekeeping, um, ranging from extremely broad definitions of peacekeeping to something somewhat more narrow uh, definitions that require a lot of cr criteria for a particular type of mission or intervention to be considered peacekeeping. Um, for most, peacekeeping is still associated with the United Nations and with blue helmets or blueberry uh, operations, but uh, not for everybody. Um, so the first definition, starting at the end of the spectrum with a very broad ideas we get from uh, Terry Mays in an article, 
Um, and it states that um, peacekeeping is any type of military force that is normally mandated by the United Nations and that uh, is related to the peace process, just in general. Um, so this is extremely broad. Right? A lot of missions could be considered uh, peacekeeping under this definition. Korea, the Korean War. Um, you know, it says that it's normally mandated by the United Nations, but not necessarily. So therefore, the first Gulf War uh, could be considered peacekeeping. Afghanistan could be considered peacekeeping. Even the second Gulf War, perhaps, you know, in a very broad sense, could be considered peacekeeping if you take a very, very broad idea of what the peace process is. Um, moving down the spectrum a little bit, we see uh, a little bit more of a narrowing of the definition. And so this is from Charles Dobby. And uh, this uh, adds the criteria of consent. So for a lot of uh, perspectives on UN peacekeeping, peacekeeping isn't peacekeeping unless the parties to the conflict agree for an, inter an intervention or for a peacekeeping mission. That's what you know, separates it from regular warfare, is that either the host state or parties and belligerent parties in general agree to have a peacekeeping mission on the ground. Um, but still, this is a pretty broad definition um, so peacekeeping is not necessarily the UN, again, um, and it's in areas of potential or actual conflict. Um, moving a little further down, uh, this is from Nicholas Desgorius, and um, here we see that in this uh, definition, um, peacekeeping is necessarily conducted by the United Nations. So there we get to a little bit more familiar ground where it's blue helmet operations. Um, it legally requires consent, Again, this, this notion that the host state, at, at the very least, has to agree to have a peacekeeping mission on its soil. Um, so, an operation like Iraq, very clearly under this definition, wouldn't count as peacekeeping. Um, and uh, Afghanistan probably as well. And uh, this definition also introduces the idea that forces need to be impartial. For a peacekeeping operation to be a peacekeeping operation, they have to be neutral or impartial to the conflict. Um, a little further down, um, this is from uh, Virginia Page Fortna, and uh, this definition sees peacekeeping as requiring the existence of a ceasefire on the ground. And this is one of the more traditional, this is um, one of the more traditional post-World War II definitions of peacekeeping, that first you have to have a peace out there to keep. Uh, so there must be an agreement, a ceasefire on the ground, and then you can have a peacekeeping. Um, but there's a lot of operations that are going on right now done by the United Nations that wouldn't fit this criteria of peacekeeping. Um, Mali, Central African Republic, Democratic Republic of Congo. There's not a lot of peace on the ground necessarily to keep there. And then finally, the most kind of narrow, strict definition of peacekeeping, and this is from uh, Merrick Goulding. And um, here we see all the kind of elements from the previous definitions, including you know, consent, neutrality or impartiality, the United Nations has to be in command and control of the mission. It's not just authorized by the Security Council, it's actually conducted by the United Nations. And you, the, an additional criteria is that peacekeeping missions use the minimum amount of force necessary. And this is usually interpreted to mean that peacekeepers can only use force in terms of self-defense. Perhaps sometimes in defense of civilians, but uh, in a lot of missions, particularly in the early days, peacekeepers were only mandated to defend themselves. Uh, and couldn't and often didn't uh, intervene on behalf of civilians. We saw that in some of the more disastrous cases such as uh, Rwanda. Um, so here we see there's a lot of different definitions. And from the academic perspective, we have this kind of wide range. And all of these were, all these articles attempted to kind of pin down a single definition of, of peacekeeping. But there's some problems in going with a single definition of peacekeeping beyond the fact that the UN itself doesn't. Um, so despite all this academic debate, we're not really any closer in terms of the theoretical debate to having a single uh, definition. Um, some authors distinguish between peacekeeping, peacemaking, um, peace enforcement, peace building. You have all these kind of terms that, that crop up around, around these processes. And it's often really unclear what we're talking about. Um, one, of the, one of the issues is the word itself. Peacekeeping, from a linguistic standpoint, it's not a clear. It's not clear from the basis of the term what it means. 
Um, so there's a, in, in, in linguistics, they talk about compounds that have a lot of you know, second bases. So something like war fighting. It's pretty clear what war fighting is. We have a lot of other terms that, though different, uh, knife fighting, fire fighting, involves some sort of conflict. Peacekeeping, other than housekeeping, I can't think of a lot of other compounds that use the same term. And so it's not at all clear just from the base of it what it means. Um, but more importantly, a single definition of peacekeeping is going to have a hard time capturing all the different things that happen on the ground in peacekeeping missions, and at least what the UN calls peacekeeping missions. So you have a whole range of what kind of missions uh, are the missions that are currently ongoing, you have everything from Cyprus, uh, the peacekeeping operation in Cyprus, which has been going on for 50 years. Uh, there hasn't been really any major incidents of violence uh, since the 1980s. And it's basically your traditional keeping a ceasefire until hopefully there can be a diplomatic solution. Uh, though it still seems to be a long ways away. But then you have something like the operation in the Congo, uh, particularly in the Eastern Congo, where you have UN peacekeepers actively disarming rebels acting against the M23 rebels and uh, taking their weapons away and engaging in very robust kind of operations that involve all sorts of military hardware such as drones and helicopters and tanks. Um, so if we're going to look to try and grasp uh, peacekeeping in a single definition, it's going to be hard to uh, get the full range of, of uh, what happens on the ground. Um, the Another problem is that insisting on a single legal definition of peacekeeping runs the risk of um, stifling the evolution of peacekeeping. I mentioned in the you know, 1948 the first peacekeeping operation, peacekeeping was just uh, you know, a two armies that faced each other, a unarmed, relatively small observation force making sure that the ceasefire lines weren't crossed and no violence happened and reporting it. It's evolved a lot since then. And if we had had a single you know, UN definition of peacekeeping, it's not clear that from an international legal perspective, uh, it would have been able to evolve you know, with the evolutions in global politics, with the end of the Cold War, with the rise of you know, non-state uh, actors such as terrorist organizations, civil wars, things like that. Um, but above all, the biggest problem with a single definition of peacekeeping is that peacekeeping is still what states make of it. Whether we'd like it or not, um, UN peacekeeping operations depend entirely on member states, on different countries. Members of the Security Council and various states around the world. Without those member states, you don't have peacekeeping. Member states provide troops for peacekeeping operations. They provide the equipment. They provide the mandates. They outline what exactly peacekeepers can and can't do in a particular mission. They decide when a mission starts and when it ends. Um, a lot of the discussion, the academic discussion around definitions of peacekeeping don't really take this into account. They don't see that there's a fundamental disagreement between a lot of countries on what peacekeeping is. And as long as there's a disagreement there, we're not going to have a single definition. Because when you have members of the Security Council seeing, not seeing eye to eye on what peacekeeping is, having their own particular definitions, um, that's, going to, that's going to make arriving, you know, agree, any agreement, whether it's within the UN or outside the UN, on a particular definition, virtually impossible. So it's important to keep in mind that while states are the obstacles, we talked about this a little bit earlier, that they are the primary obstacles to peace. At the moment, under our current system, they are also the big ones that allow peacekeeping to happen. And they're the only really legal basis for peacekeeping to happen. Um, and any sort of development in this area doesn't seem to be forthcoming in, in, in the foreseeable future in terms of uh, the idea of having you know, a standing UN army. Uh, there has been negotiations on that for probably 50 years, but it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Um, so my paper, um, my research, um, kind of returning back to that spectrum that I outlined earlier, uh, sought to place different UN states along that spectrum, and they actually fit quite well with the kind of established academic definition of peacekeeping. So these are the same definitions I pointed out earlier, and I just kind of uh, outlined the key elements. So you know you have the most most narrow definition of peacekeeping at the bottom that has all the elements of consent, partiality, ceasefire must be in place, etc. So the very broad definitions up there. 
And uh, what I found is that uh, looking at statements to the UN, statements by uh, speeches by policymakers in different countries, that the, diff um, the major countries in, in the United Nations um, differ entirely uh, on, on what they see as reasonable. And then they use these definitions, but they don't all use the same one. And in fact, even within the country, it sometimes changes over time. So just to go quickly for an example, time. Um, the United States has traditionally used a very broad term, uh, idea of peacekeeping. Um, First Gulf War was characterized by a lot of American officials as peacekeeping. Um, you know, they, have, they include NATO into peacekeeping and it's just kind of a very, very non-stringent definition. But at the same time, countries like India and Pakistan, which are the major true contributors to UN peacekeeping two largest ones. They have a very broad definition of peacekeeping as well, and it's most likely because they're looking to um, keep the options open for their troops on the ground. They have a lot of, a lot of India uh, uh, force commanders and missions are from India or Pakistan, and uh, adopting a very broad definition of peacekeeping allows them to take actions like what has happened in the Congo or in Mali that wouldn't necessarily fit in some of the more stringent definitions of peacekeeping, and it kind of allows them greater scope for action. On the other side of things, um, we see countries that generally don't support peacekeeping and have uh, been traditionally suspicious of peacekeeping as possibly a, way, um, a cloak for Western interventionism or interventionism in general violations of sovereignty. So um, Iran uh, does not support peacekeeping, who has never, I would believe, at least in the current regime, uh, sent peacekeepers to the United Nations. Um, is consistently taking a very narrow definition of peacekeeping, saying that, well, it's not peacekeeping unless it has consent, complete neutrality, etc. Um, and China traditionally has uh, taken a very stringent uh, approach to what is and what isn't peacekeeping. I uh, have up here China in post-2003. The definition that China has been using seems to be shifting in the last decade or so. Um, and I'll, if you want, I can talk about that in the questions. Um, so, what my the kind of take home point from my research is that until we have a better understanding of the different national definitions of peacekeeping, of member UN member state definitions, we can't really arrive at an understanding of what peacekeeping can and cannot be. Um, UN member states are the, once again the ones that decide which when peacekeeping happens, where it happens. And um, so these kind of spectrum of definitions have a, have a major impact. Um, this is very much a initial uh, paper, um, a, kind of a beginning of some research. Um, I think from the talks that we've had so far, the kind of running theme has been that peace, uh, peacekeeping research and activism are very much linked, and that attempts to bring about greater peace in the world depend a lot on, on research. And I think that um, understanding the differences in how and what peacekeeping is um, from a cultural standpoint and from a national standpoint, while it's you know difficult because we realize that having a single united uh, approach to it uh, is, is unlikely to happen, understanding these differences will allow us to better understand ways in which we can foster um, peacekeeping in a way that it, the term won't be misused um, and that it will in fact be uh, in the service of peace rather than undermining it. Uh, so I'll just finish off with uh, these quotations again. Um, so one of the interesting developments with that first one with the, uh, the proclamation from the Donetsk, uh, Donetsk People's Republic is that Russia in fact actually very much uh, um, stepped away from this kind of interpretation of peacekeeping and very quickly distance itself from this proclamation and, and reassure the world, essentially, that uh, they wouldn't send peacekeeper, Russian peacekeepers, or of course there's been reports of Russian troops uh, under disguise in there, but they distance themselves from the use of the term peacekeeping in this context. Um, and um, the Canadian definition, uh, to the Afghanistan example, has changed uh, somewhat since the new government has been in power. Um, peacekeeping is very much 
seen by the Harper government as what the UN does. It's not what Canada does anymore. And it's you know, in Canada's past and no longer part of our new robust military. But so for the Harper government, peacekeeping is very much just UN. And what goes on in Afghanistan is, in fact, more like war fighting. They embrace that definition. Um, finally, with the last uh, idea that peacekeeping is anything but an activity for WIMPs, um, I don't think it's an activity for WIMPs, but I also don't think it's anything. So these kind of extreme uses of the term peacekeeping, my research suggests that while we can't have a single definition, we also don't need to interpret, uh, integrate these kind of wild uses of, of the term peacekeeping, and we can focus instead on the ways that countries and particular governments um, use the term to better understand what can and cannot be considered. Thank you very much. Okay, do we have questions? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, it's a fascinating talk. I, I, I hope you'll uh, let me publish something of it in Peace Magazine. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I, I'm uh, interested in the transition in that you mentioned in Canadian policy about peacekeeping. But it, it seems it's not just the current government that has curbed peacekeeping activities. As we know, for the last uh, 20 years or so, it's been going downhill until we now have a handful of peacekeepers in the world. And that started at least under the liberals. Uh, I wouldn't put a date on it. But I, I'm thinking of um, what I believe I read uh, Michael Ignatieff saying. I, I could be wrong on this, but I think what he said at one point was something like, the age for peacekeeping is over. And uh, now we have to have, an, I think, more robust. I, 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 here I get even less certain about what he said. But I know he did seem to say there was a time for peacekeeping, and now we have to do something else. And I think he was closer to being like war fighting, maybe closer to being the way uh, the current government actually sees things, although I'd probably even deny that. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, you know, since he was one of the fathers of the responsibility to protect doctrine, I presume that nobody would call the military actions uh, under responsibility to protect peacekeeping. They'd call it humanitarian intervention or something like that. Is that right? Uh, and uh, I can't, it, it, am I right in saying that the, uh, transition to uh, war fighting uh, is, is consistent with or somehow in the same line of evolution as the change from peacekeeping to the war fighting current uh, approach that the current government would explicitly uh, endorse. Um, yes, so first of all, I'm absolutely right in that it's the kind of Canadian change for an attitude towards peacekeeping is in the current government. Uh, so um, Canada currently, I think as of this month, sends 32 individuals, uh, individual armed officers to, uh, to UN peacekeeping. Uh, the largest contributor, which I think is Pakistan, sends somewhere in the neighborhood of 7,000 peacekeepers. And at some point in, in history, uh, in the mid-90s at the peak, we, uh, we uh, Canada sends somewhere around 3,000 troops. So, the decline has been pretty massive. For the first time, Canada sends less peacekeepers to the UN than the United States. Um, and the change happened over a long period of time, but um, if I could put a date to it, it would probably be January of 2000, where there were more holders. So kind of shift over from 1999 to 2000, and um, Canada seemed to just decide that peacekeeping is what we'll be doing more. Um, I think in terms of the evolution of peacekeeping and the R2P doctrine, um, there was something of, of a development called uh, wider peacekeeping, which included more of the um, robust elements of, of military action that hadn't been part of peacekeeping before. I'm not sure if that leads to, I think part of that evolution is just the reality of, of the change in, in conflict. Um, so interstate conflict has gone down quite a bit. And most of what peacekeeping does these days 
is intervening in civil wars or cases of you know, um, governments um, failing to protect and, in fact, actively harming their own people. Um, so part of the kind of movement towards that is just that conflict is different now. And the way, you know, it's, it's not enough to have peacekeeping peacekeepers line up in between two opposing armies. Because, Why not? Because, oh, sorry. Yeah, but I mean, if I would be rude and stop not. that. You know, Libya, to my mind, was a perfect place to use that kind of peacekeeping. Mm -hmm. the, the, here you have these guys in Benghazi, and what's his face? Gaddafi said he's going to hunt them down like rats. And it did seem to need some kind of protection. If somebody had sent in peacekeepers and said, interpose them between the two sides, and had said, now back off, guys. Neither one of you can shoot each other. Then I would have endorsed that. Uh, but what they did is they went in and they took sides and they started fighting for the Benghazi guys and, and, do, and doing their war fighting for them. Now, I, I, I don't understand how that could be. Well, they don't even call it peacekeeping. Uh, uh, but what would they call uh, peace? But what would, you know, under Chapter 7, when, when they can enforce, you know, force, peace enforcement or that kind of thing, which is clearly stronger than just uh, keeping peace between by consent, it, it does mean military intervention to stop somebody who's invading or abusing. And I presume they don't call that peacekeeping, right? Depends on, again, it depends on who you ask. So certain countries would and certain countries wouldn't. Um, with the, with the um, Libya, uh, sorry, the yeah, Libya example, um, that is a really good example of why, first of all, peacekeeping is what states make of it. And second of all, peacekeeping is only going to be as, you know, as effective as the UN system allows it to be. So the big opposition to both um, an operation, a kind of blue helmet operation, which would be you know, the kind that you were talking about in Libya or in Syria uh, or even possibly in Ukraine. The big problem there is that Russia has a veto on the Security Council and the system of the United Nations is constructed in such a way that it's just, it wasn't going to happen. Uh, China also opposed an operation in Libya or Syria. So all of the limitations and the kind of evolution, you know, how far peacekeeping is allowed to go in certain places and how far, you know, how how effective it is and how successful it is, essentially still comes down to uh, the countries of the United Nations and in particular the five permanent members of the 